An Honorable Profession is brought to you by Tech for America, an organization dedicated to providing a platform to solve America's toughest public challenges. For more information, visit t4a.org. That's t, the number four, a.org. We're also supported by opencounter.com. OpenCounter builds tools for local governments to deliver permits and licenses online. Their portals make complex permitting simple, which lowers transaction costs, increases transparency, and empowers economic development. OpenCounter is a vital tool for communities across this nation, including Atlanta, Charlotte, Oakland, Indianapolis, and San Diego. Check out opencounter.com to see what they can do for your community. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports some of the most thoughtful and innovative voices in American politics. I've been a member of New Deal for years, both when I was mayor of Santa Cruz and now as chair of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Check out some of our past episodes with guests like Mayor Pete, Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, Florida Representative Margaret Good, and more than a dozen amazing leaders at the state and local level. You can find us at newdealleaders.org or wherever podcasts are found. And if you like what you hear, please tell your friends. We're trying to bring sanity to politics in an insane era. We need all the help we can get. Today, we're having a little different conversation on an honorable profession. I'm talking to actor, activist, podcaster, and all-around renaissance man, Ian Kahn. You probably know Ian as General George Washington on AMC's Turn, as well as roles on Homeland, Dawson's Creek, and Burn. Recently, he's dedicated himself to American politics by working with the New Deal, the Renewed Democracy Initiative, and a fantastic new podcast with the director of the Monmouth Poll called Guardians of the Republic. Ian and I met at a New Deal conference in Denver, and I thought you enjoy his unique perspective on American politics. We talk history, debate as theater, and the future of the Democratic Party. Enjoy. So, Ian Kahn, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It is so good to talk to you today. Thank you, Ryan. It's a real pleasure to be on here with you. So, uh, I'm going to ask you to begin as uh, your character, George Washington, uh, as you do with your amazing new podcast called Guardians of the Republic, with a quote from George Washington uh, in the voice of George Washington, because, uh, well, let's just, I'll have you do it and we'll talk about why I think it's incredibly important to to begin the show that way. Okay. It was was, uh, so funny when you sent me that email because I didn't know that you had already been listening to uh, to my and Patrick Murray's podcast. Um, so when you said that, I was like, oh, wow, that's uh, interesting. So, yeah, I was able to find one I think is, is very appropriate. Every post is honorable in which a man can serve his country. That was a letter to Benedict Arnold. I wish Benedict uh, had read that. Uh, letter a little more closely, uh, but I appreciate you keeping it uh, on brand for an honorable profession. Uh, so, you know, you spent four years p- playing George Washington uh, on AMC's turn, but you uh, you're also beginning each one of your episodes, as I mentioned, uh, of your new podcast, Guardians of Republic, with that quote. What have you learned about political leadership from sort of channeling George Washington for? all these many years? Well, uh, one of the surprises of uh, learning and becoming General Washington or inhabiting his his life story for those four years uh, was what an interesting man he was. Uh, I think all of us have thought of him as sort of the sort of marble statue who uh, was kind of very, very placid and sort of went through his life and didn't seem like much bothered him. But what was fascinating to learn from a very early, from his very early age was he was a very reckless young man. Uh, he, in his 20s, when he was uh, attempting to become an officer in the British Army, he would very often um, really step out of bounds and speak his mind in ways that people who were in authority figures above him uh, found very distasteful. And he was a very unpopular guy. And, and he also, uh, which is a, something of a little known fact, started the French and Indian War. 
um, in, but by, with, a, with a reckless act on his part. And what I found most fascinating was that when he finally realized in his early 30s, he was sort of released from the army, um, the British army, and he went back home to Mount Vernon. Those next 10 years of his life were some of the most fascinating to me because he learned how to um, meditate <laughs> and learned how to control his passions and control his um, sort of reckless ways and became someone who didn't walk through life without passion but learned how to hold it. Uh, and he thought first always of his country as opposed to himself. He sacrificed all on behalf of this young, burgeoning country and understood that every choice that he made, whether it was at war or later when he became our very first president, was going to set the tone for the rest of our time. Um, when I look at leadership today and I see what's happening in the country and I see President Trump sort of standing in front of portraits of George Washington often, um, I cringe inside. Because I think here was a man, our first, our first president, who was a man of humility, duty, um, and sacrifice. And in my opinion, watching President Trump and the way that he's dealing in the world, uh, we're seeing far less of that. Um, so for me, one of the lessons of leadership is the understanding that the team wins, that the, the individual wins when the team wins. And... It, it it's uh, it's interesting because President Trump obviously uh, uh, still contains the reckless approach to uh, <laughs> to governance uh, without having learned or the or having the selflessness. What um, you know you've you've you're a, you're a well a renowned actor, um, also a renowned uh, fantasy baseball uh, player, but. You know, you've you in recent years has really taken on just raw politics, right? Translating the lessons of Washington or just your own insights into politics into our age. Um, was that a has that been a long time calling, uh, or is this a new phenomenon? What what sort of brought you to this moment? The political world was something I've always been fascinated with. I, I took a, a course at, in college where I was studying uh, different campaigns and, and what worked in campaigns and what didn't. I followed passionately presidential campaigns, senatorial campaigns. When I became, um, when, I, when I got the job of playing General Washington, uh, one of the things that he was a great believer in is providence and that things happen for a reason. Um, one of the things that I like to believe in life is that there are things that do happen for a reason. Um, one of my mottos in life has been, uh, if, if things aren't working out, everything's going to work out in the end. And if things aren't working out, what it means is we haven't gotten yet to the end. So for me, in this given, being given this great gift of playing this um, imperfect man of greatness, which is what I refer to General Washington as, um, I, I felt there must be a, a reason beyond it. And that I was given so much by it. What is it that I can now bring to the country that he sacrificed so much for and, and loves so much? Um, and I'll, I'll tell a quick story uh, about, how, uh, about Providence and how I, how I got my house. Um, between seasons two and season three of the television show, I was away constantly. We were doing Valley Forge. It was the heart of the war. And my wife, who was wonderful and kind and loving, had watched our two children really for five months with me coming home on weekends. And she, we were living in an apartment in New York City, and she said, you know, we're getting a house when you come home. And I said, okay, that's fair. We're going to get a house. So we found a, a little house on a hill in Riverdale, New York, overlooking Van Cortlandt Park. We got a great deal on it. It was fantastic, very fortunate. And on the day we signed the papers and we were exchanging keys, um, it was the very last day, uh, the man who, was, who sold us the house I was standing looking over Van Cortlandt Park on this hill, and he said, oh, I forgot to mention this to you, but now that you're standing there, I'm thinking of it. Um, that's, a very, that's a historical spot. You actually can't do anything with that spot. And I said, okay. And he said, oh, this is really funny. Um, George Washington stood there and used to watch his troops drill in Van Cortlandt Park during the Revolutionary War. It's called Lookout Point. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. Um, and he said, oh, that's funny because you play George Washington. I said, I said, yeah, uh, you never thought to mention that before. I would have, I would have paid more for the cost. <laughs> and he said, well, it's your house now. Enjoy it. 
I said, great. And I just had a moment where I thought, because General Washington was a land surveyor. That was his profession uh, early on. He was also a farmer. He did many things. Um, but I did have this little thought where I was like, look at that, man. It's like there, there is a sense of providence. So going back to that is how can I be of service now when our country is in one of the greatest times of challenge that we've seen uh, in our history? And that's what led me to it to sort of say, you know, acting is great and I enjoy it and I've been somewhat successful at it. Uh, but if there's ever a time to sort of step into the fray of this country, now is that time. So that was what the choice was. And that's how I, I, I came to this place. And how do you think history and it's a, you get you have a unique perspective because essentially you've been living history, right? You've been embodying a different time and place in this country. How do you think it informs the way you look at the politics that you see today? I mean, for for all the innovation in politics and all the writing and talking about it, we spend an, a very little time uh, putting it into context, right? Um, it's all tends to be very in the now and in the immediate future focused. It, we barely talk about things that happened f- much less four years ago or eight years ago, much less 200 years ago. Um, how how is sort of living and breathing a different time and place in America uh, changed your perspective about American politics? That's a really good question, and I, I have a I have a thought about that. Um, when I was growing up and I was studying American history, I didn't really understand how fortunate we were to have won the war in 1776 through 17 finally in 1783. Uh, it was sort of like oh, it was a bunch of guys in wigs and waistcoats and. You know, we ended up, we were fighting the English, and they lost, and we won, and it's all good. But what I didn't realize was, going back to the baseball analogy, is that we as, a, as the Continental Army, as the young Americans, had zero reason to win that war. They were the greatest fighting force the world had ever seen. And we were, you know, they were like the New York Yankees, and we were like a college baseball team. And when you realize, and you look at it, and you understand the history of it, and you see how lucky we were and how many different moments there were over the course of this war that it so easily could have gone the other way. You realize how fortunate we are to have this country and how fortunate this we have all been to live with these freedoms that we've had for so long, living in a democratic republic that has survived all of these years. And when you look at it with that broad spectrum of history and you look at where we are today, that's how very important it is to hold on to that. How how passionately we we all must step forth as these as these new realities are smacking us in the face and changing our country. How we have to stand up for that because it didn't just come easily. It didn't come freely. Um, and so that I think that that's where the 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 past can inform the present. Must inform the present, and then will inform the future. And that really is a hallmark of Washington's leadership. I mean, it took it took fog in New York Harbor, right, for him to be able to uh, to escape uh, British uh, defeat, um, and so many times. And and it's just taking it. It's one having the luck, uh, two taking advantage of that luck in order to make it to make it work. Um, and it's, it is, it is remarkable that we even won. I remember I was once studying in England, uh, and I met a, uh, I think she was a duchess. Uh, and, uh, she asked me where I was from and she asked, she sort of said, oh, I thought you were from Australia. And I said, no, no, I'm from the States. And she's like, oh, I knew it was one of our former colonies. And I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> like we're 200 years later, we're still, uh, you're still thinking of the United There's States. Well. That. Yeah, exactly. But for a couple, uh, you know, uh, choices by Washington, but for a couple weather events, um, it, it may, may, may have been a very different reality. You know, this faith in democracy that Washington had uh, and that he built his leadership around and that now, you know, all of us are out trying to save and intervene. There's a new debate about about whether, you know, democracy can coexist with social media and with the 
the the environment we are having today. There's a new paper out about how democracy devours itself. What's your faith that the democratic experiment can continue? You know, you're spending, you're really taking time off from your career to to serve democracy. Um, where do you see? Do you see democracy surviving, and if so, why? Uh, that's really a deep, strong question. Wow. Um, do I see it surviving? Possibly. Possibly I do. Um, it's not going to be easy. Certainly in the climate that we're in presently. Because even when we had a less um, intense situation in the executive branch, we still had two parties that were not dealing with each other. Yeah. And I remember the night where Trump was uh, elected and I was driving down to an event in New York City. And I thought to him, I had this moment where I thought, in some ways, this could be the worst thing that has ever happened to this country, but it also could be one of the blessings to this country. And the reason for that is it really is has the opportunity to change the dynamics that have been going on and that have been blocking everything, to find a way to reach across the aisle in a new way. Not necessarily under President Trump. I don't think that's very likely. Um, but in what's coming in 2020 and beyond. And to take it to the New Deals, uh, to, to this organization that you, that you work with and that I'm, I'm a part of and I'm grateful to be a part of, this is the kind of organization to me that can help promote democracy and continue democracy. Because you have excellent candidates who are not coming from the far left necessarily but are trying to find a way to make things work in the country. And I think that that's something that is, uh, is what the nation is desperate for. More and more of that, more attention on people who are looking to find a way to work together, even if there is disagreement along the way. But what do you think about that, Ryan? I mean, the same question right back to you. I think there's a really interesting qu question. I teach the law of democracy at a university, uh, and I have this conversation with my students all the time because... Uh, democracy requires a lot of work, right? It's not something that comes easily, and it re it it requires people to sacrifice themselves, or requires uh, people to listen and compromise with people who they disagree with. Uh, and we have a culture that seems to be heading in the opposite direction on both those counts. It it goes back to the to the Churchill. Uh, quote that it's uh, the worst form of government except for all the alternatives. Uh, so I do think democratic institutions are resilient. I think um, we've you've seen us surviving three years of fundamentally anti-democratic rule at the federal level, in part because because you have folks, good folks at the state and local level who are uh, who are sort of one were insulated and two uh, we're trying to move an agenda forward that actually serves our community and we can have different conversations with our citizens than you can at the federal level. So, I mean, that's why I get involved and stay involved with the New Deal. But I think it's a, I think it's a big question going forward about how people um, engage. And it's not just here, obviously. We're seeing it around the world uh, as, as every democracy is challenged. Yes, by, by populism and uh, extremism everywhere. My yeah. partner, Patrick Murray, who is, um, who is the, uh, the head of the Monmouth Poll, uh, has a very favorite quote of his from Benjamin Franklin, where uh, they walk out of the Constitutional Convention and a woman says, Hey, Ben, I don't know why he always says, Hey, Ben, but <laughs> Hey, Ben, what kind of government did you give us? And he turned around to the woman, apparently, and said, A, a republic, if you can keep it. And that was... 1787. Right. And here's the hopeful, here's the hopeful spot. And even though the world has changed, Twitter, the internet, all of these things have changed. America has survived in this way with challenges, no doubt, from 1787 to 2019. There is hope with that. I have a good friend who works over at the UN and I, I, I saw him this past weekend uh, and I said, are we, are we in trouble? And he said, the good news for you is that your systems are still working. Your executive branch is crazy, and he's doing crazy things. But the system underneath him is still strong. I don't know if it'll still be strong in 2022, if you're in the same situation, but you will be able to bounce back from this. And that's why I'm involved right now. 
Because to me, if we get to this next spot and we keep going and, and we have an agreement with the American people saying, actually, this democracy, republic, business, we don't really need that. Let's just go with the guy that we believe in and follow his authoritarian rule. There's no coming back from it. Absolutely. Yeah, you, the systems, um, they, they, they've been resilient, but I think once you lose them, you you never get it back, right? Like rebuilding democracy uh, is so fraught and so much harder than than improving the system that we have. So what are you seeing as you've, because you've really taken the time to go out and engage, whether it's with your podcast, you're uh, part of a renewed democracy initiative that I want to talk about um, in, in more detail. You're out traveling the country. Uh, what are you seeing the Democrats do well and what especially as somebody who communicates for a living what are we failing to do uh that that would really help both move more democrats into power but then also uh, have the added benefit of saving the republic well you know it's i I think it's a challenging situation right now um because in the primary with uh, with Biden and Sanders and Warren, all three of them um, at the top of the ticket, and right now at the top of the polls. Um, what we're seeing is, you know, sort of centrist versus the far left. And then we have moments like with Beto O'Rourke, who came out this past week, who found his voice fabulously in the debate, was happy to see that for him. Uh, unfortunately, when he started talking about taking, yeah, we're going to take away your guns. And when we talk about Medicare for all and we, we, we talk about these these things that are, I, I, frankly, I don't think are very likely to pass anywhere. And they become sort of the, the, the statement, the purpose of the Democratic Party, and it can be used in propaganda against the Democrats. I think it's very dangerous for the Democrats because I think that it gives more of a chance for Donald Trump to sort of stay in power and stay in place. Uh, it's something that uh, it's a, a pretty grave concern. I see now. I, want, I do want to talk about the New Deal uh, and the, the the graduates of the New Deal, right? Or New Deal leaders. So someone like Mayor Pete, who I remember uh, watching on uh, his CNN town hall, and I just looked like, my God, that is one of the best communicators I've ever seen. And I've been hearing about him through Holly Page, who is one of the leaders with New Deal, um, and I, I was looking at him and saying, you know, that sort of conversation talking about Medicare for all who choose. There's wisdom to that. And it's part of what the New Deal organization is is trying to do, is find things that will work for all, right? So some of the graduates, I just want to talk about them. Of this organization, that's only been around for, what, eight or nine years. Yeah. Four, four of them I'm going to speak of that have come and made their presence known on the national stage that were sort of incubated and raised with this great organization. We've got Jason Kander, who uh, ran for Senate in Missouri and now is doing some fantastic work, which both of us saw in the New Deal uh, conference in Denver, working with veterans with PTSD. You've got Andrew Gillum, who came within a a whisker of being the, the next governor of Florida. You've got Mayor Pete, who is currently one of the top five candidates for president on the Democratic side. And you have Stacey Abrams, who again was within a whisker in Georgia. That is four of the bright young leaders in the Democratic Party that were sort of given a place to grow with this New Deal organization, which is why I'm so interested in being a part of it. Because you you mentioned my fantasy baseball experience. (laughs) Baseball, you have the major leagues, and that's what everyone focused their attention on. But really, if you're paying close attention, there's five other leagues, five other minor leagues, that also is where all of the major leaguers come from. They all come up through that system. The New Deal Democrats are the best of the minor leagues for the Democratic Party, as far as I'm concerned, and why it's so very important to make sure the New Deal Democrats have a great voice. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And this is my you know one of my longtime frustrations is I felt like the right through the Federalist Society through other means really nurtured their base and they focused on winning school boards and city councils and boards of supervisors, uh, and then obviously 
gerrymandering state legislatures. And um, but they had a sense of the long game, uh, whereas the Democratic Party was all about, you know, sort of like show up, volunteer and, uh, you know, walk a bunch of neighborhoods and we'll give you a pat on the back. And that was sort of where the where the mentoring and the support stopped. And so I am grateful for organizations like the New Deal, which is saying, no, we're going to invest in you. We're going to pull you together. You're going to build relationships across the country uh, so that so that you can, one, have you know a shoulder to cry on when things get really hard uh, and good ideas to steal when you're ready to implement whatever climate change or economic opportunity initiative that you want to. But then also... Um, recognize that this is that we need to start building the team not just for 2020 but we need to win the midterms in 2022 we need to win big cities and you know uh governorships uh you need to win all those races if you want to see the change um that that you see and it's great to have a sort of validation from you from the outside that you're seeing that as well yeah, and Ryan, you were asking about communication skills. One of the, you know, the reason Donald Trump is president of the United States is because he's fantastic television. That's what it was in 2015, because he broke all the rules and he became must-watch TV, right? Yep. When you look on the Democratic side, there are only a couple of the candidates who are running for president right now that I would even put in the conversation in, ter- in terms of being able to communicate in that way. Uh, Mayor Pete is on that list. Elizabeth Warren is top of that list. And that comes from her history as being a college professor. She understands what it is to engage the eyes, the the ears of her listeners. And I'm finding that Cory Booker also uh, recently in these last few debates has really been sort of top notch. And that's something that I'd like to see the Democrats grow. I'd like to, to see them work with their candidates and starting in the same way that the New Deal Democrats do, starting with city council members, mayors of small cities, state senators, and grow that ability because it takes time. It takes time to become a good actor. It takes time to become a good communicator. So that's something that I'm pretty passionate about. I'm trying to find a way to be of service in that way. And uh, this is, uh, I want to dive into this a little bit with a little more depth because so that television as a medium, right? Obviously, people talk about Kennedy versus Nixon, um, but uh, as and it became and then people are saying, oh, no, we're going to move to Twitter and social media. And those are important. But Donald Trump really owns the medium of television and he dominates the especially the cable news uh, networks. What do people need to understand about television and that medium in order to succeed on it? Uh, So Okay, this is, uh, this is right up my alley here, and what I'm most excited and passionate about right now. Uh, on, as an actor, you have two different jobs. There's the theater, which is a perfect place to train, and where I spent the first 10 years of my professional career, and then you have television and film and media. They're both acting, but they're two completely different jobs. Almost like playing two different sports. It's almost like playing baseball and basketball. They're both athletic, but they require completely different skills. When you're on stage, you're in front, let's say you're in front of, um, I did a glass menagerie at St. Louis Rep. When I was 24 years old, I played Tom in the glass menagerie. It was a 1100 seat house. It was a huge house. And I was playing Tom. So there's a lot of monologues. And my job on that stage was to make sure that every person in that back row had almost the same experience as every person in that fifth row. Okay. And there's a skill to that. You have to use your size, you have to use your space, use your voice. Transfer that now to the television world, where all of a sudden, a thought registers without even opening your mouth on camera. So you have different candidates, like we just, I just mentioned Cory Booker. Cory Booker is really quite good on television. Unfortunately, when he gets in front of a stage, he doesn't quite know how to modulate that. Now, it's typically the other way where people are really good in front of large groups of people. It's something they're used to. They talk in front of large groups of people. But then all of a sudden you're on TV and you need to simplify everything because your message is going to get across with your words and with your thoughts. And I think that politicians on the Democratic side, it would behoove us on the Democratic side to start training our politicians to be better in both of these mediums, both on camera 
and in front of large groups of people to understand that actually I've got to bring a different me to the table. Same human, same ideas, same thoughts, but a different volume, a, a different level of um, expressing myself, all of this. And I think that if we can learn to do that, because President Trump's great at it. I mean, there's just no way about it because you, you, you never know what he's going to say next. So it becomes fascinating to watch because like, well, what are you going to say now, pal? And that's, we're not going to find Donald Trump. He's, he's a, we don't want to find Donald Trump, frankly. Right. Um, but we do, we do want to find candidates who are equally good at both. So looking at Elizabeth Warren in front of a large group of people, she's fantastic. Sometimes when she's in an up close interview, her volume's a bit high and she needs to settle. She needs to understand to breathe. Someone was asking me about Amy Klobuchar, who I like a lot I like her a lot. I think if there was a lane for her, she might be the best candidate to take on President Trump and find success in these Midwestern states. Problem is, when she gets in front of large groups of people, she she doesn't breathe. And she gets ahead of herself, and she doesn't stay on her breath. Well, all that does is it turns the audience's ears off. And our goal as Democrats should be to open as many ears, eyes, and hearts as we can over these next number of years. There's nothing more vital. <laughs> I think uh, I think that's your next podcast is uh, Ian Khan teaching Democrats to breathe. Uh, I think that's... Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Meditation, man. Yeah, exactly. Meditation before you go on stage. Uh, it is... Every time I played General Washington, I woke up and I meditated for 20 minutes to find that sense of calm. And then right before I went on screen, because twice a day you want to do it. So once when I woke up and then once right before I went on screen. So when I was there, I was present. I was listening. I was in that moment. So very important for an audience to see a politician, someone who's trying to tell them how they can make their country, their world better, their lives better. That that calm will in, will enable that trust. What do you, what do you suggest for the Democrat who does win the nomination and is on stage with Trump? Right, like that's a that's a that's a different dynamic. How do you how do you perform next to chaos? Yeah, that's great. Okay, well, there's a good acting lesson about this. Uh, it's a really good one. Michael Caine, who there's a book if you want to be an actor and you want to learn how to act on screen. I, I highly recommend Michael Caine on film acting. It's both a video, which I think you can find on YouTube, and a book. And what he says is sometimes he does a scene with someone, and I've had this experience in my career, where you're looking across from them and they're doing all of these enormous things that are better suited for the stage than they are for the screen. And they're making all these giant choices. And you're like, whoa, dude. And what you do then is you go the other way and you simplify yourself even more. So whatever's going on with your partner on, on screen, at least for what you're bringing to the table, will be very, very palatable. So it really depends on who the candidate's going to be. And whoever that candidate is has got to be great on their feet, right? So if it's uh, Elizabeth Warren and she sees him starting to do the business that he does, um, she's going to have to, she's going to have to stay alive and present and not lose her head. Unfortunately, uh, I had said to my wife in 2016, I said, just give me an hour and a half with Hillary Clinton. Please, somebody, let me sit down with her and work with her for an hour and a half and she can win. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't sit down with Hillary Clinton. Um, but, but I felt that you know, there was a key moment. Let's look at that moment in, this, in the second debate where Donald Trump gets up while they're standing, it's a town hall debate, and walks and stands right behind her Right? Yeah. Like it was moving a horrible over. moment. Yeah. It was a horrible moment. And I was sort of like, are you kidding? What, the, what, what are you doing? If she was in her perfect, if she was in, I think she did the best she could. And I, I, I'm not going to rip on Hillary Clinton. I think she gave great service to the country. But if in that moment she turned around and said, stop now, stop behaving like that. That's not appropriate. Please, please go back to your space. And was able to sort of flip it onto him in that way. Instead of, I can be as tough as you. I don't think I can be as tough as you is going to work with Donald Trump in 2020. Because he, he's pretty tough because he doesn't care. 
Right. He doesn't care. He doesn't give. He doesn't care how it plays. He doesn't care who he offends. He's going to do what he needs to do. So it, it's incumbent upon the Democrat, whoever that person is, to to be able to work within that. You know, that's what I think. It's fascinating stuff. This is the stuff that is uh, most interesting and exciting to me. Do you have? And I'm sorry. I'm just I because I, it's it's you have just it's unique perspective. So I want to stay on for a second. How do you feel then? about Biden's ability to share that stage. If this is all going to be determined on whether people can breathe and react, uh, it's a terrifying thought. Um, but uh, but w- so what's your, what are your impressions as Biden's debated so far? So far? Yeah. So far? Uh, so far, that's the trick, right? I mean, that's the dangerous spot I think that Democrats are in. Because Vice President Biden is to be honored for his service to the country, Senator, for so many years from Delaware, his personal sacrifices that he's made. Uh, He has every right to try to campaign for the presidency. However, um, as the standard bearer for the centrist part of the Democratic Party, the problem we have is he's not very good at debating yet. And if he's not good at it yet, I'm not sure when he's going to get good at it. Right. It's going to take a very specific human to be able to bring, I mean, you know, you and I could do a weekly podcast about, you know, how would Sanders do against Trump? In some ways, I think Sanders would do quite well, actually. I think he would have, I I think he would, I I don't want to talk about how he would do in the election. I think that would be a darn struggle. And it scares me, right? It's, it's troubling in a way. But on that stage, He'll just, he'd be two heavyweights just swinging at each other. Just two, two New Yorkers, right? This would be just a, a neighborhood brawl. Yeah, it would be. And, and Sanders, would, Sanders would succeed. I, I really do believe that. I also think that if he were, I, I feel like I'm avoiding the Biden question, but in 2016, if it was Bernie versus Trump, I think Bernie would have gotten the better of him on that stage. I really do. Um, but again, back to Biden. Um, I, I, I am not... You know, I, I was pissed off, excuse my language, with Julian Castro. I thought what Castro did was um, awful, really. I thought it was rude. I thought it was Trump-like. I thought his response afterwards, uh, the next day, sort of saying, I don't even know what you're talking about, was equally Trump-like. Yeah. But someone did make a good point, which was, if you think that's rough, wait till you see what our president is going to throw at Biden on that stage. And Biden has... Understandably, he's a human being. In that moment with Castro, he, he was thrown off his game, you know, and he recovered, was able to hold it together till the record player business happened and the latter part of the debate, which was a disaster. Um, but, but what he was able to do in that moment was, was almost recover. But Castro stopped punching. Trump will never stop punching. And uh, I like Joe Biden a lot. And I like the idea of someone who's not coming from the far left being the nominee. But I worry. I really do. I worry about how he'll do one-on-one against President Trump, who is a very powerful man. Not, not humanly. I mean, humanly, he's a weakling. He's a, he's a bully. He's a coward. He's, he, he's all of these things that I, I really do think he is. However, when it comes to presentation, he's just going to keep swinging. So we need to have somebody who is able to take a punch duck a punch, duck five punches, and then find their way to, to, to the flurries that will work. That makes sense. It's, a, it's You're making me more nervous than I was before I started talking to you. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it, it, is, it is a daunting task. Um, and this goes back to the question of what our democracy values, right? If, if, it, if it really is going to be determined not necessarily by ideas, but by... Uh, essentially theater um, and personality that's a that's that's a that's a scary concept but um, but hopefully hopefully someone out there uh, working for one of these presidential candidates is listening uh, to this podcast and uh, and is calling you up to get to get the hour and a half on uh, breathing and and uh, you know controlling the stage I would dedicate uh, if that if that is the case and we have a nominee let me let me give if, if we have time. Let me yeah. let me tell you one nominee who I think might actually thrive under this circumstance, um, and and doesn't mean that I'm supporting this person. 
I'm not. I'm, I'm actually staying completely out of the democratic process to wait so that whoever the nominee is, I'm going to do everything in my power to be in support of. Um, but Elizabeth Warren does have the ability. I, I, her Medicare for All is challenging. Her uh, immigration stances are challenging. That being said, if we're having a battle of personality, <laughs> right, and it's who can, who can perform better on television, I'm pretty positive that Elizabeth Warren can handle herself on that stage. Um, the, the socialist moniker is going to hurt a lot, um, but she is smooth and she is strong and she's already taken some punches from the president and she's still walking. So uh, there is, it's not a hopeless situation. It's a challenging situation though, for sure. It's amazing because it shows you how much, how quickly our politics develops. Because if we were talking about this six or eight months ago, right, uh, I'm not sure Elizabeth Warren would be the person that you'd say, oh, she's definitely the one who can go on stage and have that personality battle. But as the campaign has developed, she is, she really has adjusted her approach and called on, you know, her her experiences and her obvious intelligence to adapt how she campaigns. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is partly why you have campaigns, right? Is to flush, flush these things out um, in a way to, to help the candidates present best their ideas to the American public. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So uh, I, let me encourage everyone, if you, uh, if you have a chance, check out Ian on Guardians of the Republic podcast. Uh, he has partnered up with the head of the Monmouth Poll, so you get good both sort of data insights and personal insights into the the theater and the and the data of politics. And it's been wonderful having you engage with the New Deal. As a New Deal leader, I'm grateful to have you in the room uh, and really bringing this these insights that that again we never hear uh, to the Democratic Party and and emerging leaders. I want to thank you for taking the time today. It's re really been fun talking to you. Ryan, it's my pleasure, and uh, thank you for all that you do for the New Deal Democrats. It's a it's a, a great asset. Thank you, everyone. Please uh, please join us for future episodes to hear those leaders, to hear your future presidents in the Democratic Party, and uh, now you got two podcasts to listen to. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to an honorable profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders, and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcast. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep this honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.